everyone, welcome to the show Built with DAs. I am your host Valentina Brega and I have a special treat for you today. I am so excited to have this amazing entrepreneur who has gracefully accepted the invitation and wanted to join us today to talk about how he built a successful real estate business with the help of virtual assistants, how he found people, how he's training them, how he's fostering their loyalty. There's so many good things that's gonna come out of this interview and I can't wait to dive deeper into this and share this with you. Welcome to the show Built with VAs and today I have this awesome guest, Ron Angel. Ron, welcome. How are you today? Thanks, Val. I'm doing great. Awesome to come on the show with you. Yeah, great to have you here. So Ron, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. So I'm a real estate investor. I help people earn double digit returns backed by real estate. I do lots of things in real estate. I've done um, and continue to do wholesaling, fix and flips, buy and hold, short term rentals, and I'm getting into some ground up construction. And I'm also very focused now on uh, raising capital uh, to help people earn those double digit returns. Very cool. When did you start in real estate? So I actually started very passively a long, long time ago, uh, back when, uh, like right after I got out of the military, I used to be in the, the U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got out, my wife and I, whom you know I met in the military, we were stationed in South Korea together. We moved to Georgia. That, that was her next duty station. So she was still in and we bought a house knowing that we would eventually kind of rent it out. It's something that a lot of people in the military do. They move from duty station to duty station, acquire properties and leave them behind and, and rent them. So like I knew that that was a strategy a lot of people did. So that that's what we did. About a year later, we bought another rental property uh, as well and kind of kept those uh, in our, you know, you can call it a portfolio. It was just two houses for about 10, 12 years. Okay. Uh, it was very passive at the time. Didn't really know what I was doing, but uh, that's, that was kind of my start. And it was very sort of dormant for a long time until I got started to get more active. Why did you decide to get more active in real estate? What made me get more active in real estate? So I was, after I got out of the military, I finished my college degree and I went into the tech industry. I was a software engineer for many years and kind of was like climbing the corporate ladder, getting promotions, salary increases, all that stuff. Um, eventually moving up to a role of a director of software engineering, had a lot of teams under me, mm -hmm. but I was getting really tired of corporate America. I was getting tired of tech, frankly. I was getting further away from the details. I wasn't doing as much of the software engineering anymore. It's more management. Um, and it was also during COVID where everyone was working from home and I got to stay with my family. You know, I, I got rid of my three hour day commute, a lot more time with my family and realized really what was important to me. Um, it was spending more time with them and, and being there for them. And, you know, you always tell yourself that you're doing, you're, you're working so hard for your family. You're doing all these extra hours for the bonuses and the raises and the equity and all that. You, you're doing it for them. But like I realized that in a way I wasn't and, and I wasn't showing up the way I wanted to for them. I wasn't spending enough time with them. And so I realized that I, I needed to find a way to uh, get freedom of time and financial freedom so that I can really show up for them the way I wanted to and, and have the, the time freedom to, you know, to show up to the uh, gymnastics meets and to show up to and like chaperone school trips and like all those types of things. So I realized I wanted to get out of corporate America and I, I needed to find a vehicle for that. And to me, having done real estate before, I knew that that was a vehicle that people were using. And so it was kind of obvious to me that that was what I was going to do. When I met you, you were still in your W2 job full time. And then uh, I know at some point you left and you pursued real estate full time. How you, know, you kind of told me why and I understand the why behind it, but I, it must have been a scary process. I mean, what kind of thoughts did you have back then? What fears, what concerns did you have? You just went into this completely in, into real estate. How was yeah. that for you? It was definitely a little scary. There were some things that I did to mitigate the risks. I mean, in reality, I did not really establish my business before leaving my W-2 job. I know a lot of people start building their portfolios, start developing their business and getting uh, an alternative stream of income before they jump ship. I didn't. I mean, I, I started to get some pieces in place and I started to build the business, but I did not have, I had not replaced enough of my income to really you know, do that. And so I had set myself a, a capital runway and also joined the seven figure flipping mastermind as a way to buy speed. Mm -hmm. Right. And to celebrate mm -hmm. things. But it, it definitely was scary. You know, it was um, trying to think of how to phrase this. I knew I could do it and I knew I, I needed to work really, really hard to do it. And I knew I had the pieces in place to be successful, like joining the mastermind, the capital runway I set aside for myself, mm -hmm. uh, you know, support from my family, That's support from coaches. 
Yeah. Um, so I was willing to take those risks and just see how it played out. Yeah, that's very important to have support from your family, someone who's uh, standing with you and, and taking this journey together. How did you hire help? How did you grow your business or how did you or did you do everything by yourself at the beginning? How was it? The first thing I did, like the real active steps was joining the seven figure mastermind. Mm -hmm. And um, it's part of that mastermind where uh, we get into small group accountability. And so that's like uh, five to eight people that meet once a week to talk about, you know, their wins for the week and what their goals are. And we also track progress against, you know, like you have quarterly goals. Mm -hmm. um, and in the very first uh, accountability meeting, we were talking about what are our goals for the quarter. And the facilitator was like, well, do you want to you know, you're trying to get a certain number of deals, you know, a certain number of contracts. Uh, do you want to hire a VA? Like, wh what are the things that you want to do that? And that was actually the very first time that I thought, hey, actually hiring a VA as a first step like that, that would make sense. Because at the time when I joined the mastermind, I was still working my W2 job full time. I was planning to leave by the end of the year. So I, I had a couple of months and I figured that that would help give me leverage to do some of the, you know, more routine tasks and, and help me focus on the core money making activities like because uh, I was going into wholesaling. So generating the leads and talking to sellers and all that stuff. And so I went about trying to hire a VA. I set my goal for the quarter that by mid quarter, I would I would find and hire somebody uh, and bring them in full time. Did you hire on your own or did you go with it through a company? So I, I wasn't aware of any companies that can help you hire. Um, I, I went online. I did some research to figure out how I would actually do that. I found a, a site that can help you find and sift through candidates and stuff. And like you can see profiles and resumes and post job ads. But it was all very manual. It was, it was a huge undertaking. I spent about a month, month and a half going through this entire process, submitting the job, post, like making the job post perfect and um like screening through i think there were a hundred plus candidates and going through that and shortlisting and doing like virtual interviews by email where i would send questions and i would get that back it was so much work and then i ended up shortlisting maybe five or six candidates that i then went and did like an interview a live interview over zoom and then it was a huge undertaking i, I ended up with a really good result i found somebody really great but it was a, it was a lot of work you're absolutely right it is not an easy process like i know when we write ads we get so many applications, but sifting through them takes a lot of time. So we, ha we have 100 applicants. Out of those 100 applicants, uh, we check voice recordings to get people who whose accent is not that strong. So maybe that's about 30%. Out of those 30%, we give them a test. Maybe 10 people complete out of 100 complete the test. And out of those, again, sifting, sifting through it. So maybe we can find one or two good people, if that. If not, you're just going to have to restart the whole process again and and uh, but it's worth it. You know, there are, there are a lot of talented people worldwide. I'm so happy to hear that you had a good result. And yeah, um, yeah it, it's it. I think it's worth it. Is that person still with you? They are. They're still with me. And, and just to go back to the process of finding them, like you said, it's a it's a ton of work. Totally worth it. And at the time, I had the time to do. Right, I was still working my W two job, but I was like kind of gearing down, right, offloading responsibilities to my replacement and that kind of stuff. And so I had the time to do that. Mm -hmm. for somebody that's like a really busy uh, entrepreneur and like you're like if i had to do that now that would feel overwhelming for me to take something like that on like i would need help because yeah. now i have so many things that i'm managing in my business like having somebody that can help with that is huge advantage but going back to whether they're still with me yeah absolutely still with me she's uh, her name is grace she's uh, awesome and wonderful and you know after this podcast gets published i'm going to send her the link so she can hear me talking about how much I appreciate her and, and how integral she is to my company. She was my first hire and she'll be with me forever. Um, and uh, she she helps me offload a lot of work and um, very responsive, super high attention to detail. Um, and she just like makes my life a lot easier. I'm able to be so much more productive by um, offloading repetitive tasks and even, even one-time tasks um, and we can talk about strategies for offloading one-time tasks in, in a way that makes it really effective. But yeah, it's like she, she just saves me so much time. Yeah, it, it's so important to build the, this relationship and nurture the relationship with your VA. And I feel like a lot of people think it's hire and forget. Oh, I'm going to hire this person. I'm going to offload all these tasks and I can uh, sip margaritas on the beach. That's not exactly how it happens, right? Like you have to put time, you have to put effort into building this uh, connection and this uh, this rapport with your VA. Um, and that's how you you foster loyalty, right? Like that's how they, everybody wants to have a place where they belong. 
uh, NBAs. Yeah. They want to feel like they, they, the company is taking care of them. Uh, they feel like they can grow. All of that. Do you, what do you do to foster loyalty with your VAs? And this actually goes back to my experience in tech. So we had offshore teams as well. And I've seen offshore teams be done really, like really poorly. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it done really well. So in one company, we had offshore teams where they were not treated like other teams. It like just mm-hmm. kind of like it was like fire and forget, like send some work over there and hope that it comes back in a few weeks or a month. Um, and then grumble and complain about how crappy they are when they mm-hmm. when they don't perform and they don't work as hard as your local teams. And in another company, the next company I moved to, I saw I saw it be done really well where the offshore teams, they're just like any other team. You treat them exactly the same and you try to build the same culture, right? Mm-hmm. And, and indoctrinate them and assimilate them into the culture. And it's no different than anyone else. They're, they're all just human beings. The fact that they're um, in a distant country in a different time zone and maybe getting paid less, like that's some of the advantage of hiring people off shores there's, mm-hmm. there's you know the economic aspects that doesn't make them any less productive less talented and less worthy of being part of an ama- you know great culture and being treated like like anyone else yeah and so i brought that philosophy to my new company and um and i have i've had other people offshore as well and so basically we we interact as a team just like just like anyone else and i really like the notion of of thinking of them as full-time employees and pouring into them just like as as if they were local and sitting right next to me. I'm going to treat them just like any employee. I'm going to invest time in getting to know them and understanding uh, who they are as people um, and pouring into them, training them and helping them to get better, thinking about their career growth and, um, you know, building up their skill set because they're just going to like that builds the loyalty that you talk about that creates the culture that you want. Um, they're just going to be that much more productive. And they can surprise you. So I know that this exactly resonates to how I'm running my business. I have six virtual assistants right now in my team, and they've been with me since the very beginning. Nobody has any intention of leaving. They are so dedicated, so loyal. They put their heart and their soul into everything they do, and we have the same core values. To me, it's very important to share my core values, and we hire, we fire around them, we grow people around them, right? So. And you're absolutely right. People want to have that sense of belonging and they don't feel treated any differently. They are, I really deeply care about them. And we, uh, I say we're not a family. We are a team of professionals, a team of A players who always brings their A game uh, to the top. I care about you. If you need anything, I'm here for you. But, you know, like in a family, well, uh, in every, in every family, you have to support that crazy uncle who shows up at Christmas parties, but oh well, his family, you know, like, so we set the expectation really uh, clearly with my teams. Like, I care about you and people need it some time off. They have emergencies. They have family situations. I, I gave them time off. I helped financially as well, but they, but they also perform really well because they, they, they feel like, um, they're professionals. And that's, that's very important. Like what you mentioned, don't treat them any differently. They are, treat them as employees, not as freelancers. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So when you hired, um, uh, Grace, I think you said, right. And, and I know you had other VAs as well. What criteria are you looking for? How are you finding the right person? Like what do you, yeah. What's important yeah. to you? So a couple of things. So there's a couple of lenses I look at it through. One is core values that you talked about. That's, that's paramount. That's, that's primary. Um, the other is, based on the role itself. So what am what am I expecting them to do day to day? And so what kind of profile of person am I looking for? Um, at the time, I was not using DISC or culture index. I didn't even know those things existed. Um, so I really focused on, um, you know, I started with core values. I, I baked that into my job description, if I recall correctly. It's been about a year and a half since I did this, almost two years. But um, uh, I made it very clearly, very clear what my core values were in the job ad and, and asking people that, uh, fit those core values to apply. Um, I also wanted somebody with a super high attention to detail because the the um, the objective for this role was to be you know executive assistant admin type role, so not client facing, not someone who's going to do cold calling or lead management or anything. Just kind of um, do a lot of the admin uh, work, email management, calendar management, uh, pulling lists, you know, data, these kinds of things. So. I made sure to um, have very high attention to detail kind of things in the job ad where um, in the job ad I put, and it was towards the end. So somebody would have to read the entire thing in order to respond correctly. I put, when you respond to the job ad, put which of the core values I listed you most resonate with and why. 
put that in the subject line. Um, and so that allowed me to sift through a lot of junk that where people didn't bother to read the job ad. And if I didn't see that in the subject line, I could just decline, decline, decline. So that helped me. Um, that helped me tremendously. And then throughout the like the, there was a sort of a virtual interview process where we went back and forth via email, like Q and A. Uh, I also included a lot of questions related to um, both the the core values as well as the attention to detail kind of stuff. So based on the experience that they've da done and and things like that. And I think I had one sort of uh, test assignment for them to do. I don't recall what it was specifically to make sure that there was a high attention to detail. They, they were good in Excel or Google Sheets, these kinds of things. And so that allowed me to find somebody that had the super high attention to detail, had the core values fit, and I validated the core values fit in the final interview and the, you know, the attention to detail that's really important for this particular role. Yeah, you're describing our process exactly. That's how we always uh, also run ads and we say, hey, put this in the subject line because we, if people, people, some people just apply generically everywhere and we don't want those kind of people. We want somebody who took the time, read the ad, see themselves in it. And I, I also put the core values in our ad and I even say it, if you don't see yourself in these values, that's okay. Don't apply. You will not be selected. Like I literally say this, this phrase. So, uh, just to make sure that people who really resonate with our values, uh, they apply. And yes, definitely put something in the subject line and absolutely test, test their knowledge. Some people can really impress you with their resumes or at the interview. Uh, you can really fall in love with a candidate, but unless you test their knowledge, you don't know what it's like working with that person. And the right, and some people are afraid that, well, I, nobody wants to complete this work. No, nobody wants to do this for free. The right person will, um, will be happy to have this opportunity. I've never had any issues with this. I've been doing this for my team, for all the ways that we hire for other companies. The right people don't have an issue completing a, a test. I, I agree. I mean, if someone is interested in that role in particular, like you want them to be attracted to the core values and the role in the company. And if they are, they're going to want to work for that company. They're going to be willing to do some work up front to get selected. And if they're not, they're probably not a fit anyway. That's how I look at yeah. it. Yeah. So the, the VA that you hired, she's doing executive assistant, admin tasks. Um, mm -hmm. What exactly is she doing? Is she managing your calendar, your inbox? What does she do? So many things. So, uh, you know, as a real estate investor, I, you know, I wholesale and, and flip and I do a lot of direct to seller marketing. So she pulls lists for me. She'll upload them to the CRM, get it skip traced, you know, move it into this system for marketing, that system for marketing. So I use like uh, launch control for bulk SMS. I use call tools for all cold calling, uh, all kinds of systems. So she, she does all that stuff. So that, that stuff just kind of magically happens in the background because at this point, uh, I've trained her and we've iterated enough to where the expectations are, are set. She knows exactly how to do all those. Um, there's lots of other kind of admin tasks like that. She also does uh, calendar man management for me, not email management for me right now. We haven't found a way to make that work efficiently for it to actually offload stuff off my plate. That's probably more a function of, you know, m my having taken the time or not to, to figure out how to get that right. Because I know a lot of people do get that right. I just haven't found a way yet. Um, and what else she does? Um, she helps me with SEO. She'll, she updates my website and, um, and we're doing that kind of stuff. She tracks SEO stats. So she'll pull data from, uh, my carrot site and Uber suggest on a weekly basis to get the stats so that we can review the KPIs. Like that's a thing I wouldn't, you know, that would take me probably a couple hours a week to do every, every single week that that could completely gets offloaded. And there's, and there's lots of other stuff, like lots, lots of other stuff, lots of ad hoc stuff too. Like, let's say I get a task. Um, so an example from yesterday, <clears throat> I needed to take a pitch deck, an investor pitch deck and, um, kind of modify it and brand it for my company. So I took an example from another investor and all I did was said, um, I, I pulled up the deck. I used a tool called loom to record a video. So it records my screen and I can talk through it. And I said, Hey, take a look at this deck. What I want you to do is just uh, modify it, brand it, you know, get our information in there and then, and then send it to me for final tweaking. And by the end of the day, it was done. So, so I spent, what did I spend? Um, you know, about two seconds to copy the deck about three or four minutes to record the loom video and then send it to her. Um, and, and that was it. Now it's done. I need to go back and review it. And I, and I will spend more time looking at it, maybe tweaking it. I might record another little loom video asking for some changes, but I've spent very little time, you know, doing all that. And I, and I have almost a finished product. And you can always keep that recording in your 
vault or training vault. So whenever you need to bring someone else on board, you don't spend time training them again. Right? That's, a, that's what a lot of people are afraid. It's like, well, I know I can do it faster. I know I can do it better. And I don't have the time to train new people to how to do everything. But it's just, if you have a system and, and, you know, VAs can read your mind. But if you have, like, how long does it take you to make that Loom video? A couple of minutes, five minutes. And then you always skip it. So you always, always have it on file. And let's say if Grace is promoted and you need to bring someone else on board to take care of her responsibilities. Well, A, she can train them because she has already done done that, but also to protect her time, uh, those people can watch the videos and it's, it's, it's a much smoother process and it doesn't involve your time. And frankly, that's what makes a business is the systems and processes, right? Like that's what allows you to scale and, and, you know, re replace people if, you know, if Grace decided to move on or, or something happened and, you know, somebody else had to come in, like we, I have now that library of, you know, all the training. Um, I use a system called Trainual to, to, to capture all that stuff. And now that's just like ready to go training material to, to onboard somebody or if the team expands, just like you said. A lot of people that I speak with are afraid of letting go of this control. Like they have some limiting beliefs, like nobody else cares about my business as much as I do. Nobody else can do it better than I can. Um, I'm, I'm only going to be, they're only going to do 80% as effective as I can do it. Like, you know, there's a lot of limiting beliefs and letting go of this control, letting go of the vine seems to be the hardest thing for them. For them. How was it for you? And um, how did you convince yourself that, hey, I need to, I, I have to take this off my plate? Or was it difficult for you? So for me, it wasn't too difficult because I've done, you know, I've been in management before. So I know the power of leverage and, and relying on people to to help and contribute their talent, right? If you find the right person, they probably, and maybe not everything you do, right? So everyone has a genius zone where they are the best in the world at that thing. But for everything else, if you hire the right person, they will be better at it than you and they'll be faster. So it's a question of finding the right person um, and really having that belief. Now for me, I there was also what helped me make a mindset shift that made the hiring decision very easy was uh, a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. It was partly the catalyst that made me decide to leave my job, frankly, um, e even before uh, I was on that journey. So in that book, I highly recommend you know that as a read or a listen. It, it talked about that's how you can have a 4-Hour Workweek because you leverage talent right and, and find people to help do the routine the routine thing absolutely i always try to delegate upwards so like for example a lot of business owners that i know uh they know their strengths they know their weakness and a lot of them poured so much time and energy into working on their weakness so for example social media is my weakness i'm gonna spend time learn about learn about how to do it right why I mean, this is something that can be delegated to someone. Your weakness can see, can be some somebody else's strength, right? So give them the chance so you to do it much better than you can. Delegate up, right? Delegate up, delegate it to an expert so you can focus on your strength and you can focus. There are some things you can never delegate, like being the face of your company, uh, networking with people, um, raising capital, right? Like people raise, cap you raise capital with people who know and trust you. So that's something that require your business needs you to be in that capacity rather than pulling lists and doing the busy work or doing social media or whatever, something else. This task can be delegated to an expert. Um, and even if there are some, let's say, even if you are an expert in, in social media, um, I would still delegate it to someone else because again, your business needs you to be in a different role, in a different capacity. Um, even if somebody does it at 80%, how you would do it, um, it still frees up your time to bring in more revenue and, and build your brand. Absolutely. And like the way I would think about it is <clears throat> the, the, your main money making activities, is it actually doing the social media or is it going out there and, and networking and, and raising capital or doing, you know, being the, the face of your brand, and doing those other things? Even if someone did it not as good as you, that activity or that difference in quality is not going to impact your revenue as much as you spending more time on the core money making activities. So now that we talk about money, I know you all also hired people for um, to generate leads for you, be on the phones, right? Yeah. Uh, cold call, maybe follow up. I'm not sure. So can you tell us a little bit about what other positions did you hire VAs for and how it impacted you financially? So I'll, I'll use an example of my other uh, full-time hire. His name is Yusuf. So um, I hired him as a cold caller through your company, actually. And um, we went through the whole process of screening. You guys shortlisted a few candidates for me and I interviewed a few and, and I selected him. Uh, this was about probably almost a year ago and he's, he's still working for me. Um, he's actually the core you know, generator of leads for my company right now. 
So he does bulk texting for me, bulk cold calling. He does some single line dialing, cold calling for more uh, uh, niche lists, like uh, people that we want to get a hold of. Um, and he does uh, do some lead management for me as well for the leads that are in the CRM and continues to follow. Um, and he's he's a he's a huge help. He's right now because I've shifted focus to other areas like fix and flips and capital raising and, and things like that. He's now the core engine for you know the lead outreach and the lead generation. He he basically does it all. So um, I, I absolutely could not do it without him um, uh, right now. Like I would not. Um, I would have to jump back in that seat or replace him immediately. Like if he decided to leave or, or move on or, uh, or whatever it was. So, but, but he's, he's great. Again, great culture fit, really good fit for the role itself. Loves talking to sellers, um, loves doing what he does. And, um, and we are like, we're a team, we're a, a team of a players, like all, all like working together. Okay. So the VAs that you hired so for lead generation use of his from a different country than Grace, right? Like, uh, I know yeah. if he's from Egypt, I think, right? Yeah. And Grace he's is actually from Egypt, correct. And Grace is where? Philippines? Uh, Philippines. Okay. How does it work uh, culturally? How do they communicate? And it's different time zones. Do you feel like this is a, an issue for your company or do you not notice that at all? I almost don't notice it. So it's funny because we, I think we have a great culture in the, the team. So every time that every morning, 9am is kind of when our day starts, everyone gets on. And the first thing I see on Slack is good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing all that kind of stuff. So it, it's really great. And I'm not the one initiating it. It's the team, right? So, so that's really cool. And so you think about it in the Philippines, it's probably like what, what, 1 a.m. or something. I don't even know what time it is. Like um, and in Egypt, it's um, they're I think seven hours ahead, so it's the afternoon. But everyone says good morning, so everyone's like on the same, almost on the same virtual time zone. Now, when you hire when you hire folks overseas, the understanding needs to be that they need to be on the time zone that you need them to be. As long as those expectations are set and people are committed to doing that, it, there's really no issue, right? So I think that the expectation setting is uh, is important. Like people need to understand what they're they're signing up for, they need to be okay with that. And the way that they arrange their lives needs to accommodate it. Mm -hmm. You are describing what's happening in my company as well. I feel like we're so in sync. It's like, it's like we're describing the same company. My team does the same thing. The first thing in the morning, it's good morning, good morning, good morning. And they are the ones initiating that. And uh, one V in particular from my team, if it's Mother's Day, if it's Father's Day, if it's everybody's birthday, they create these banners. We all get together and we wish each other happy birthday. And it's such a healthy environment. And it's and people are from all, I have people from Egypt, from India, from the Philippines, from Mexico I had, right? So it's like all over the place from Canada. So it's just, it, 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 we all come together as one and it's such a healthy environment. Do you have any meetings with your uh, virtual assistants? Again, just to foster that loyalty, how often do you get together with them? I love this question. So um, one thing I did at the beginning of this year that I think helped us tremendously is we do something called a daily standup. Mm -hmm. So this concept comes from tech, from the tech industry. Um, it comes from agile development. So basically it's a it's a morning meeting usually for 10 to 15 minutes, it's very brief. Uh, you bring everybody together. This is suited for smaller teams, right? You're not gonna bring 30 people into a room together, a virtual room, but like five to, to eight people can do this in 15 minutes. And everybody talks about what did they do the day before? What are they focusing on today? And what if any blockers they have? So what do they need help with? And so that that is a uh, gives us an opportunity every single day to course correct, to make sure that uh, people are working on the right things, right? So for me as the leader of the company to, to know whether we need to make a course correction on what we're focusing on, to know what's going to happen today, right? So if I need something else to happen today, I can send marching orders of, no, actually, I need you to focus on this today or how's this going? And then if so, if anybody's blocked on anything, and that could be because they're waiting on me for something or on each other for something, they're communicating that can immediately identify what are the things that they we need to do to unblock them so that they can be fully productive. For them. So we do that every day that that makes sure that we're talking consistently you know we're, we're continuing to build that team atmosphere so everyone feels like they they're not just on an island and you know doing things virtually and not getting to talk with anybody um, we do that as um and and it also um helps us make sure that everyone's kind of moving as, as quickly as possible and being fully productive. Uh, another meeting that we do on a regular basis is um, every Friday we review our KPIs. So we'll we'll look at um, how many leads we've generated, offers made. Um, we look at our SEO stats to make sure that, or to see how they're performing, to see that SEO is moving in the right direction. So all the really key important things that we're trying to move the, the needle on, 
we're reviewing every single week. And we, after we do that, if anything is off track or we didn't hit the KPI, we brainstorm, okay, what are the things that we can do next week to turn this around, right? So what are the specific key action items with owners, like who owns this action item too, to, to do that. And then also as part of the following week's weekly meeting, we'll review, hey, what were the action items from last week? Did did they get done? You know, if not, why not? You know, that, that kind of thing. So we're continually trying to dial things in and making sure that we're, um, you know, moving the ball forward on, on these key performance indicators. Yeah, the more you involve your team, the more dedicated they are. And um, yeah, the more loyal I feel like they are 100%. Now, um, a lot of people I speak with, they're afraid of hiring someone to be on the phone because they say, well, VAs don't really understand the American way of talking. They don't understand sarcasm. They don't understand the culture. They have a very thick accent. They sound like a telemarketer. Uh, and yet you speak so highly of uh, use of the person that you have on the phone. Um, how, how, what criteria are you looking at? How is his English? How, is that at all a, a, an obstacle in getting good leads for you? I mean, Yusuf is, is really good on the phones. He's, he's fluent in English. Okay. Very, very fluent. He, de- he definitely does have an accent. Okay. But that hasn't gotten in the way of him generating a ton of leads. Um, if he had, if he spoke with a absolutely perfect, you know, American accent and tuned to my market, would he generate a few more? Probably but it hasn't gotten in the way at all. Um, as far as understanding, you know, the culture and sarcasm and things like that, there have been times where I've noticed he hasn't picked up on certain details that I would, or, or maybe a native born speaker would. But again, I don't think that needs to stop anybody. So what I've done is I've continued, like when I listen to his calls, I'll point things out so that he um, develops and gets better. And this, this goes back to what we talked about earlier about treating people just like any other employee and pouring into them because the time I take to do that is going to help him improve and he's just going to do a better job for, for me the next time. So the more I pour into him, the better he'll get and, and also the loyalty, the more loyal he'll be and want to stay with the company longer. And then that magnifies the return on investment for me in the company over time. Yeah, that, that's very important. And I, I know exactly about the accent. I, as you can tell, I have an accent too. And I, <laughs> I started this, uh, I, I, I was on the phone starting in what, 2018. And that was actually one of the reasons why my former boss, you know, Bill, he was hesitant to bring me on board because, well, she doesn't sound like a southerner, you know, <laughs> not just American, but specifically like we were calling people in Florida and Tennessee and it's like, I'm not sure she doesn't sound like a southerner and then it was the CEO of the company who put in a good word and I said I think we should give her a try and uh, I think he's been pretty happy with my with my results right because he speaks highly of, of what we accomplished together and the accent it's it's it is important but it's not as important as people are uh, think right it's it's often not what you say it's how you say it it's how you connect with people it's how you understand their pain point and um you can be the best cold call caller in the world. And if that person is not your avatar, it's just not going to be a deal. It's not going to be a fit. Uh, but if somebody has any, any pain and if you know how to dive deep and understand and, and, uh, and talk to them and just connect human to human, people forget about your accent. They, they just focus on what you're, what you're saying. And I feel like this is so important because that, that's my story as well, right? Like with the accent. So, yeah. So, uh, do you think it's possible to run a business with VAs, entirely with VAs? That's an interesting question. Um, I think in the long term for my business, no. There there are some aspects, like especially in real estate, like I'm going into fixing and flipping. Mm-hmm. I, I need some, I need boots on the ground. I need somebody to go and talk to the contractors and all that stuff. But a lot of the other elements of my business, so the lead generation, talking to leads, even getting contracts, like Yusuf's gotten me a couple of contracts. We moved him to an uh, an acquisition role and he's been doing some acquisitions. He's gotten me multiple contracts. Um, There's very few things other than um, things where you need to be physically local for whatever reason, like real estate is you know, there's certain elements that you absolutely need to, everything else can definitely be run by VAs or, or performed by VAs. If you can be done on a computer, can it be done from anywhere in the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, like you need a good internet connection and the right equipment and all that stuff. And that's part of the expectations that you set when you're hiring candidates. But as long as that's in place, you can be done from anywhere in the world. 
I agree. So uh, I feel like a lot of people who are who might be listening to us, they they will resonate with your story because it's so so inspirational. You left a W two job to pursue real estate. You made uh, good hires. You know, you you shared some golden nuggets on how you find the right people, uh, what you look for, what 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 you put in the ad, uh, how you sift through people. Um, what tasks you delegate to them? Um, what's next for you? Like, what's what do you see uh, your company in a year or in two years from now? Yes, yeah, so I'm working. I'm working on pro- probably too many things. Um, I'm doing. I'm still working on wholesaling and lead generation. Um, I started fix and flips with a partner, and I'm focused on capital raising for uh, multifamily and also for um, uh, hard money lending as well. Where do I see myself in a year? It's a little bit hard to uh, imagine exactly. Most of my focus is going in right now uh, into capital raising. So where I want to be in a year is uh, um, I want to join a, um, a multifamily syndication GP team. I hope to have two properties in the, in my multifamily portfolio as a GP. I'm in other syndications as an LP. I want to do that. Um, and I want to build out my uh, hard money lending business. Um, uh, and, and again, uh, leveraging other people's money, giving them an opportunity to earn double digit returns backed by real estate. So both for multifamily syndications and for uh, hard money lending. Uh, it, additionally, I'm trying to build up um, active income streams, both through the wholesaling. Um, I have a partnership with another investor where primarily I'm sending him my leads and he's closing and doing the dispositions as well. Um, I'm really excited about that partnership and also the fix and flips with my other partner. And we're trying to build up our rental portfolio. But th- those fix and flips, I'm working on active income because on the multifamily side, it'll take a little bit more time to you know, close those deals and start building up uh, that I- income stream. Mm-hmm. If somebody wants to connect with you, for capital raising, for multifamily, for whatever, how do they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So uh, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. Uh, so you can reach me, Ron Angel, on Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram as well. I don't post that much there yet. I will be more active there. I can't remember what my handle is on Instagram. We'll put the links uh, here so people can can find you yeah. easily. So, so on Instagram, I'm Ron underscore R underscore Angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram. That, that's primarily where people can can find me. So you can um, DM me on either of those, and uh, I'm very responsive. I'd love to get on calls. Uh, really, what I when people reach out to learn about real estate, the, um, what I try to do is try to understand because we should we, we can uh, back up a little bit. I'm also a coach in the Seven Figure Mastermind. I'm a coach for for runway folks, and the way I show up to those coaching calls, I try to figure out where that person is in their journey and what they need to do next. And it's the same thing when people reach out to me about uh, either investing with me or just curious about real estate. I try to figure out where they are, what their goals are, and see how I can serve them. Sometimes and often it's not through investing with me on a multifamily syndication. Sometimes they just want to learn how to, you know, um, they want to learn more about real estate, how they could do it themselves. So I might refer them to, you know, um, a couple of podcasts and a book to read. Uh, and then try to sync up with them again in a few weeks to see if they've made any progress and how how best I can serve them eventually. So anyone reaching out, that's what you can expect to get from me is I'm going to show up to serve you and see where you are in your journey and what you're looking to accomplish. And I'll help direct you to what I think the best resources are uh, to get you to where you're trying to go next. Yeah. And, and for, for those of us, for those who are listening, Ron is a great person to have in your network. Uh, he has uh, so much knowledge about the industry, uh, always willing to give good value, always willing to help. And yeah, it's just a, a, a very genuine. I think you're a very genuine person. What you see is what you get, right? So you really want to help people. And, um, it's, it's really a pleasure getting to know you and, and watching you grow all this, uh, all this time. So, um, yeah. So now um, at, at the end of the podcast, do you have any advice for people who are looking to uh, hire a virtual assistants, but they're afraid, they're scared to take that step, but they have a lot of limiting beliefs? Uh, knowing everything that you know now, uh, would you do it again? Would you change something about it? What would you tell these people? A hundred percent. I I would totally do it again. I mean, the result that I got has been tremendous. Grace has saved me just a ton of time. Yusuf's been been amazing. Um, So I I think hiring uh, VAs is it's a it's a way to unlock a lot more potential in your business um, and to scale more rapidly um, and in, in an economical fashion. Right. Um, for those with uh, limiting beliefs about that, it, it's hard. Like those are the types of people that need to reach out to people like me and uh, 
you know, hear it directly from somebody else that they know, like, and trust that it's possible and what the potential is. You know, for somebody that listens to a lot of podcasts, reads a lot of books and is still afraid, they need to reach out to someone who's done it and is doing it to, to, to get that kind of firsthand experience to hopefully shift that belief and, and move in the right direction and be willing to take what to them might seem as a risk to me seems like an obvious decision, you know, depending on where you are in your business. But I think, you know, networking with people who are doing it, you know, getting into different rooms is key to help shift the mindset. Mm -hmm. And and also, uh, you can choose a company to you can hire on your own, or you can choose a company to help you with that. And when we work with people, we understand VAs are people, they have uh, needs, they have emergencies, situations can arise, but work with a company who who's flexible on that. If something happens, they'll replace the VA, they, they'll find a solution. So your business doesn't have to stop and you always have the right person in the right seat. Um, so that that's something that I, um, I also, I know it's, it's a scary step. It's, um, it's letting control, letting go of control. It's not easy. Maybe it was easier for you because you have that background. But for a lot of people I speak with, this is such a nerve wracking step. So just work with a company who understands these fears and can take good care of you. Absolutely. All right. Well, Ron, thank you so much for, for being on this show. I truly enjoyed our conversation. I will leave the links uh, here in the description so people can find you easily and get in touch with you. And thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Well, yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's been a blast. Thanks.